Uh, our next firebrand resource person, Vardarina, will share her insights on why the development justice model is so very crucial to achieve human rights for all. Vardarina works at Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development, and she is co-chair of Asia Pacific Regional Coordination Engagement Mechanism. She calls herself just a simple feminist next door, thinking about dismantling patriarchy and corporate power. Over to you, Rina. Thank you so much, Shabha. Uh, it's very funny how you, I'm sorry, I start my video now. Can you, I hope that you can see me now. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's very funny how you quote my Twitter profile <laughs> and also the Instagram profile. Thank you for that. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, hello, everyone. I'm Rina. I'm from APWLD. And then I'm actually really happy that I spoke, uh, at, that I'm going to speak after Sh uh, Shamala because she already mentioned about the sustainable development goals and then also the SDGs and UPR and et cetera. And then the accountability mechanism that is also happening in that two processes, right? So, uh, but I just want to give you a background, some framework that we in Asia Pacific, most of our civil society is actually built together this uh, model of development that we call development justice. So this is actually really uh, going, the, the development justice model is actually established uh, in relation with the, with the adoption of the sustainable development goals. So that time in September, 2013, which is eight years ago, uh, a lot of civil societies, peoples and social movements from different parts of Asia and Pacific came together. So we have the trade union, we have the feminists, we have the farmers, we have the indigenous peoples, we have the social and community enterprise, you know, we have the people with disabilities. We came together in Bangkok uh, at the Ministerial Dialogue on Post-2015 Development Agenda. And then in that meeting, there was a CSO forum. And then we actually discuss what we envision as the world we want, right? So we are we know exactly what kind of world that we don't want. And then we also envision if you know we put together all the demands, all the uh, what do you call it, uh, all the, all our demands together and then conceptualize it, what will it look like? So after that, we have development justice. So what I'm going to do now. I know it, this is, uh, I'm going to share you a video. I don't know whether we have, wait, yeah. Uh, I'm going to share you a video of development justice. Is there any of you probably also see this video already? Okay. And I'm going to share sound. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Yes, you can. And then I will try to do that. We live in a world where a Bangladeshi woman garment worker in her entire lifetime earns less than what the CEO of Inditex earns in just four days. And this inequality is escalating. Built on the notion that development and growth go hand in hand, this profit-driven model has channeled wealth, power and resources from the poor to the rich. Only 26 people own the same amount of wealth as the world's poorest half, most of whom are women. Rich nations claim they are developing poor nations through aid and investment. In 2012, developing countries received $1.3 trillion, but lost $3.3 trillion. Who is developing whom here? Unregulated corporate greed has also worsened the global climate catastrophe. Just 100 corporations are responsible for 71% of global carbon emissions. Meanwhile, the Pacific Islands are drowning and they have contributed next to nothing. The world is seeing its first climate refugees from Papua New Guinea. The United Nations has warned we have a little over a decade left to save the planet. 
Our democracy and human rights are under attack from governments, corporate greed, and war. In 2018 alone, 321 human rights defenders were killed across 27 countries, 39 of whom were women. Government spending on the military rose to more than $1,700 billion. This could have paid for the education of 1.9 billion people in South Asia, 17 times over. But it does not have to be this way. People everywhere are resisting this unjust model and demanding development justice. A model that places the poor, the marginalized, and the planet at the heart of development. It aims to reduce inequalities between countries, within countries, between peoples, and between men and women using five transformative shifts. Redistributive justice means taking wealth, power, and resources from the hands of the few and putting it back into the hands of the many. Just an extra half percent tax on the world's riches could educate 262 million children and provide health care for 3.3 million people. Cutting 10% of annual investments in the defense sector could end poverty and hunger in 15 years. In Chhattisgarh, India, over 1,700 farmers fought back when Tata steel plant grabbed land from 10 villages. The farmers were arrested but persisted. After eight years of struggle and demands to the government, Tata finally withdrew and the farmers got their land back. Economic justice means economies work for the people rather than people working for the economy. It means people and workers define and decide what their work is and where it will be used. It means their work will be recognized and valued and that workers are guaranteed decent work, a living wage and the freedom to unionize and organize. Strong unions reduce inequalities. In the last eight decades, unions have boosted wages by 10 to 20 percent. For years, nurses in India were largely unorganized, lowly paid and subjected to exploitation. Six of them came together and formed the United Nurses Association. Initially based in Kerala, UNA spread across the country using its power to bring about wage increases and better working conditions. Its efforts improved the public health care standard and led to a decrease in the nurses to patient ratio in many hospitals. We can wipe out discrimination, marginalization and exclusion of and violence against people of any class, race, ethnicity, caste, gender, sexual orientation or other identity. Social and gender justice includes dismantling an oppressive system of patriarchy that's being reinforced by globalization, fundamentalisms and militarism. We can repeal discriminatory laws and implement better ones that ensure women's rights, voices, agency, autonomy and bodily integrity. Every year, one in five Kyrgyzstani women and girls are kidnapped and forcibly married off. After fierce campaigning by the women's movement, the Kyrgyzstani parliament increased the sentence for this crime from one year to eight years. Worldwide, a handful of rich countries and individuals contribute the most to the climate crisis. Environmental justice means those historically responsible should pay. It also means moving from a fossil fuel-based economy towards a feminist, fossil fuel-free future. Energy and resource democracy is possible. We can transform the economy in a just and equitable way. We can shift jobs from polluting industries to jobs in sustainable, clean, renewable energy industries led by communities and led by women. Within these sustainable economies, we can stop the exploitation of women and their unpaid care work. But this can only be done by recognizing and investing in the care economy. Through the 1980s, toxic byproduct from the Panguna copper mine in Bogotá, Papua New Guinea, devastated surrounding farmland and livelihoods. This triggered a decade-long armed conflict that led to the shutting of the mine. Thousands of Bougainvilleans lost their lives. The mine has since remained shut through the efforts of the women of Bougainville, who as late as 2017 blocked a legal maneuver which could have reopened it. The community has proved alternatives to large-scale mining do exist. Many Bougainvilleans are already participating in developing these alternatives. We want a system of governance where any person, regardless of how remote, poor, and marginalized, 
likely may be, can hold the highest person in the government to account. People should have the right to make informed policy decisions and to ensure those in power are answerable and accountable to the people. Good governance means establishing policies and practices that restore the power of communities and peoples to determine how resources and state budget get used. It also means regulating multinational corporations and making trade and other economic policies transparent. In Jakarta, people and communities are taking back their power. After decades of receiving poor quality water at one of the highest water terrors in Southeast Asia, a citizens' coalition has been fighting water privatization through a class action lawsuit. While the effort to remunicipalize water continues, the country's Supreme Court has recognized that water privatization has violated the people's human rights to water. People and communities around the world have shown that a new, fairer approach to development is possible. Can our governments show courage and political will by listening to the people and taking action to change the current unjust, unequal system? It is time for us to unite and exercise our collective people's power to reclaim our rights and our sovereignty. Join us and demand development justice. Hi everyone, okay, so that is our video, Development Justice video. This is actually the second video that we have. We had the first one. And, and welcome back. Well, wait Now a we turn our attention to the critical issue of the imbalances. Okay, sorry for that. All right, yes. Uh, so that is the first, uh, the second video, and then the first video we already have it in 2014. So this is the most updated one, and then try to actually dissect what the five transformative shift of development justice means, right? So we actually know we have redistributive justice, we have economic justice, we have social and gender justice. We have environmental justice, and then also the last one is accountability to the peoples. Some of you asked in the chat box whether that we have the translated version of this. Yes, we actually have in seven languages. We have Vietnamese, we have uh, Bangla, we also have Thai, and then also we have Tamil uh, and then Nepali. So please uh, go to our website later on. I'm going to put it in the chat box. Yeah, uh, about this development justice video. But but first of all, maybe I just want to have like a quick interaction in the chat box, maybe, yeah. What is actually, just put in the chat box, the word, how this video makes you feel. What is actually that you take from this video? I'm going to wait for you a little bit. Is there any certain feeling that you get watching this video? empowered that's very good dipti yes empowered yeah it's very empowering to see the movements that actually do you know already doing the development justice right like we are trying to do redistributive justice by uh, land reclamation you know and etc people power hopeful right and then also very good feeling capture hope all right that's great that's great. <laughs> that's great. Optimistic. Yes, that's really great. The first video, I'm going to also send it to you. It's actually, you know, focusing on the anger. Yeah, on the 2014, we actually want to make a case why there are so many feminist movements, women's rights movements, and all the other movement, social and people's movement in the world is actually one a system change. And then what we meant when we are saying that we want a system change, right? Uh, we know, like for instance, uh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to give some recap, right? Over the last 40 years, there's this one global economic and political system that is really defining the development model that we have. It's corporate capitalism. Yeah. This model assumes that development and growth goes hand in hand. You know, if you don't grow, then you are not developed. You know, they are synonymous. That's their belief. That's their narrative. 
and that the more money around move around the more countries develop so that's why the need to actually have investor coming to the country and etc cetera, etc cetera. and then we know that this model of development see uh when gdp actually gdp growth counts as development like i said where war actually brings more profit than peace which is now happening where illness brings more profit than health we can see it now yeah totally uh, is actually give more profit to the big private companies the pharmaceutical companies and etc cetera, etc cetera. and then also we also see how this last decade has been defined by a lot of crisis we've seen the global financial crisis we have the food and energy crisis we also have the catastrophic climate crisis climate emergency right now that we have and then we also see now with the situation of covid we are going into the debt crisis yeah and then also the one that we have been saying since the beginning when we are uh, doing a focus for sustainable development there's a crisis also on the well uh, inequalities right on wealth power and resources between countries yeah between rich and poor and between men and women and other social groups we see we say it really really clearly that time during the uh, uh when we are doing advocacy for the sdg and then for us you know uh, for the feminist groups and women's human rights group we also see that at the root of all this phenomena and then the crisis that we have is actually the economic policies that really fail most of the world's population and most acutely women and girls this is not just because women are more vulnerable to the human rights impact of food insecurity or the issue of environmental degradation or land and natural degradation it is because the prevailing economic model that we have right now is actually perpetuates and often relies on the systemic discrimination and disadvantage experienced by women in order to generate growth right so it's it's really clear you know the way that we see it for instance how companies participating in the global value chain is actually rely on the devaluation of women's work as a source of competitive advantage right we've been used exploited you know over and over again in this kind of production system the second one there's a lot of cutback of social safety nets subsidies essential public services because is made possible with the assumption that there is women there available you know our work is available for our women's unpaid labor to fill in the gaps of care so we this is why feminist uh, organization usually say that neoliberal capitalism is sexist they are patriarchal you know and etc and then also the very way you know economic activity is defined requires the complete devaluation or gross undervaluation of women's unpaid care work whether that it is at home or in family business or etc so our work never considered uh, not given any economic value or even though that uh, without that econ economies could not function right so we believe actually you know uh, that time when we are proposing development justice a very very strong feminist analysis also in development justice we believe that challenging gender equality and achieving a uh, women's human right requires also directly challenging economic policies institution and accounting that have entrenched social inequality and often undermine the capacity of the state to make regulation for the purpose of the people yeah so this is very important aspect of development justice and then we 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 we've seen it very very much yeah for instance uh, i just want to give like some a little bit more on what is development justice frame act so it's framed by five transformative shift 
redistributive justice, economic justice, social and gender justice, environmental justice, and accountability to the peoples, which means like uh, dismantle any existing system that channel the resources and wealth from developing countries to the wealthy countries and from the people to corporation and elite. So we want to dismantle those systems. And then economic justice means develop economies that enable dignified life, decent work and living wage, and it's not based on exploitation of the peoples or natural resources or environmental destruction. So we usually say there's a very famous development justice code, which economic justice means economic that work for the people, not people working and exploited by the economy, right? And then also uh, environmental justice means to recognize the historical responsibility of countries and elites within countries whose production, consumption, and extraction pattern have led to the human rights violation, climate crisis, and environmental uh, disaster. Social and gender justice means we need to eliminate all the patriarchal system, casteisms, fundamentalisms, eliminate all forms of discrimination, marginalization, and exclusion that pervade our communities. And also ensuring that we have democratic and just governance that enable people to make informed decision over their own lives, communities, and also the future. So development justice is there, the movement is there. We have been having this since 2013, and then it's a growing movement in Asia and the Pacific uh, civil society. It's our political unity in the region when we are actually talking to the government and also to the UN what we meant when we said we want system change. So I'm going to stop now. I think that I'm already over my time. <laughs> I'm going to give it to Shoba again. Shoba, go ahead. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you very much, Rina. And uh, for me, it was horrifying data which you gave and just uh, uh, so, sort of inspiring us to work towards a feminist fossil fuel free future. Yes. I think. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we have a few questions for you. Uh, Nahid Khalid says, development justice model makes so much sense, but governments and even civil society often are in work in silos. Health is a different program uh, than women or gender program or climate or environment or finance or trade. How can we lobby for development justice approach in the Asia Pacific region? Yes, Rina. We can't hear you. Yeah, Shoba, I also need to leave quite early, so I, but okay. I'm trying to... Uh, okay respond to this like beautiful great questions that we have here uh i'm going to open again my my chat i'm really sorry so nahit nahit uh i believe that you're from the pacific maybe yeah because you're asking how we can lobby for development justice approach uh yes it is true that government and also civil society often work in silo and then this is also the reason why we actually want to put together that time the development justice model. So a model that is actually encompasses the issues that being felt by the Asia and the Pacific communities and the peoples, right? So that time when we are actually established this in 2013, it started with a survey, right? The survey is uh, showing, for instance, uh, the su survey is showing like what are the trends of issue that is happening now in Asia and the Pacific that time, right? And then also uh, what are the solution that uh, the civil society proposed? So that's why we came together and et cetera. And then of course, you know, uh, across social movement or across people's movement, uh, conversation needs to happen to make sure that us in the civil society, we are not working in siloed. And then this is what we have been trying to do uh, for, uh, in the Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. We have a people's forum. Uh, I don't know whether that Shamala mentioned it uh, beforehand. So before the EPFST, which is going to happen on the 28th until 30 March the, uh, next year, we're going to have a three days 
people's forum when all the movement you know cross sectoral is coming together and then try to consolidate our position what we want for the for the next HLPF and EPFSD and then what are the systemic issues that we can still feel now right so uh, that is one thing and how we actually put uh, civil society not working in silo but of course the the government is a different thing i think that for some you know when we are talking about climate justice historical responsibilities the issue of debt the issue of you know how the debt, uh, debt cancellation for instance it also resonate well with the with the member state in our country right so it it is we have a potential actually to actually push for development justice model with our government. The problem is our governments in Asia Pacific are horrible for the gender equality and women's human rights. So this is something that we need to also strategize and understand and how we capacitate and then also try to get allies, you know, and et cetera. So yeah, I'm going to check whether that I have another one. Uh, what you are saying is very ideal, but how to start pragmatically when the problems of inequity are systemic, deeply rooted, where do we start? I do agree, Calvin. The thing is, not so many people talking about the systemic part of it, right? The systemic issue. A lot of time when we are talking about SDGs and then, uh, you know, the UN, the government always say that, let's hear the solution, yeah? Let's not talk about the problem. We want the solution. What is actually pragmatic? What is actually what we can do, you know? But for us, it cannot be a clinical solution. It cannot be a band-aid solution. If we're talking about justice, right? So there should be a good exposure what we meant uh, by injustices. Right. So this is this is the issue that we also want to highlight, because only then we can actually do some systemic change or uh, yeah, we, we can do some system change if the system that is, uh, you know, really make us suffer and oppress us is actually exposed, dissect, unpack and then dismantled, right? So this is something that we do pragmatically. What, what some people, some of us done is that using this development justice indicators, we actually monitor the sustainable development goal. So we're not using the SDG uh, indicators that are uh, made by the government. When they are talking about goal two, we, we, all, we, we, we are not only talking about the, how many uh, women or uh, people are malnourished or don't have land, you know, but we also track, you know, what is actually the land grabbing issue in the country, right? We track who own the most of the land, how many percentage of that land actually belong to the uh, small and uh, uh, small farmers, and then how many of those, you know, uh, belong to women. Right. So that kind of thing that we can do is actually to really put like evidences of why this model of development is not working. Uh, I hope that's yes, thank enough. You. Yes, thank that's you. Ready. I think it answers many of the questions. And of course, we can go on and on and have a separate session altogether for uh, to talk more about development justice. Uh, but right. uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Rina. Thank you very much.